with those beautiful clips, I wish you all welcome from Jyväskylä, Finland, to this webinar, How to Achieve Great Results Through Self-Leadership, hosted by Nordic Business Forum and Oslo Business Forum. My name is Aslak De Silva. I'm the CEO of Nordic Business Forum and the board member of Oslo Business Forum, and I'll be the host for you today. Today, we are so fortunate to dig in into various perspectives related to self-development and self-leadership. For today's agenda, um, we're going to kick off with a few practical notes here and uh, before moving to the main session. So Ryan Holiday is, the best, is a best-selling author, a famous growth hacker, and a stoic leadership expert. His books, Trust Me, I'm Lying, The Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy, have been translated into more than 30 languages and are bestsellers throughout the world. His company, Braschek, has advised Google, Taser, and Complex, but also multi-platinum musicians and, uh, and uh, some of the biggest bestseller authors in the world. He's well known from his eye-opening stories and reflections of and, and what we can actually learn from these stories. Finally, at the end of today's session, we're going to uh, summarize the key takeaways so to make sure that you don't miss anything um, some, and the key aspects that we've covered today. Today, I personally hope to learn uh, things on how to focus on the right things that which actually ma matter, not how it looks on outside, but also how to understand um, more in depth what's required to be a lifelong learner a student for life, and also how to overcome failures and obstacles in life. Please use the opportunity to share your learnings um, from this webinar to make sure that your friends and colleagues also get the learnings. Today's hashtags are MB Forum 2021 and OB Forum 2021. So please share what you picked up from here on social media channels. And for those who haven't been attending our live sessions before, the following two things are good to know. During the, the, the discussion with, with Ryan, you are able to ask questions through Slido. For you to access the Slido, you can either uh, exit the full screen mode and, and the Slido appears there next to the window, or you can use your camera on your phone and just uh, show it to the QR code there on the screen and you'll be able to go to the Slido. So also, apart from asking questions, you can also upload the questions that you feel are the most important for us to cover today and this way show us that what's an important topic to cover. And uh, while we, why don't we start with that? It's always fun to learn where are we from. So you can now and go to the slider and, and type in there where you're watching this from. And while we wait for the answer, so just a reminder for you that it, will there be a recording of this webinar? Yes, the recording is, will be available on live.mpform.com and obform.com under the leadership platforms behind the logins to the, the members out there. But now, let's see where do we actually have people from here watching today. Oh, it seems that Helsinki, Stockholm, Tallinn, Oslo, but also home office is, is kind of uh, the, the thing for today. But we seem to have a lot of variety. Nice to see from Nurviarvi, but also from Spain, Zurich, Riga, so very international crowd. You are all welcome here. But now it's time to move on to the main session how to achieve great results through self-leadership. And reminder, this is a live session, so please do ask questions. But now it's truly a pleasure to have you here live from across the Atlantic. And even if the weather seems not to be perfect, they're more like what we have in the Nordics, but welcome, Ryan Holiday. Yeah, it's great to see you guys. We, uh, it's four degrees in Austin right now, four degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, the electrical grid is so taxed, they've been doing periodic shut shutouts of, uh, of electricity. So it's been a strange couple of days. It, it's almost like I'm up there with you guys. Well, we will happily, hopefully see you soon in end of September in Helsinki, yeah. but now you get the weather now, so, <laughs> but great. But yeah, Ryan, uh, can you, because your, your story is interesting. You, you were a young, really successful person and uh, still successful, but can you share us your story in brief that what you have done in your life so far? Yeah, it's, uh, I appreciate that. So I dropped out of college when I was 19. I, I had this sense that I wanted to be a writer. But to me, the, the, the way that you become a writer is you have to have actual experiences that that writing is based on. And so um, I, I dropped out at 19. I, I worked for a great author, a guy named Robert Greene. 
And then I was the director of marketing for a, a company called American Apparel. So I sort of had these two tracks where I had a sort of a corporate marketing uh, life. And then I had this life where I was training uh, to, to be a writer. And uh, I left the corporate world in 2011 to write my first book. And I've done 10 books in the last 10, 10 or so years. Um, and, uh, it's, it's been, it's been quite a ride. I, I believe like you, you, you have to take risks. Um, but people often think that sort of taking these risks, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, being a writer means sort of blowing up your life. And, and, and so while I did take these risks in terms of dropping out of college or leaving my corporate job, I always kind of had two things going at the same time. I'm, I'm a big believer in sort of building parallel tracks. And then when you're able to jump from one train to the other, there's there's something for you to transition towards. So my life has been sort of one of, you know, seemingly being successful on one lane uh, and, 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 and being good at what I did, but always had the eye towards what I wanted to do next after this. Yeah, that's that is super interesting. So you kind of had the goal of becoming a writer, but then really had to pull it off in other aspects of life as well. Yeah, that, that's right. I think a lot of people, they want to have a book. Uh, I, I hear from authors, uh, from people, who, oh, I'd love to do a book or, or I'd love to have a book. And and what they're, what they're missing is that you really have to have something to say, something that only you can say, something that's a culmination of a unique set of experiences or expertise. Um, you know, the, the, we talk sort of about thought leadership. That's really boring to people. You have to have done something or discovered something or been a part of something that, that makes you stand out and makes you unique. So um, it, sort of along the lines of, of uh, being a writer, I'm also always have an eye on experiences or things that, that might be unusual. Like I'm talking to you, I, I live on a small ranch outside Austin, Texas. Um, and, and part of the reason I have it is I love it. And part of the reason I have it is because it was a crazy thing to do when we decided to do it. I'm always kind of looking for that, that interesting thing. There's a great expression, writers live interesting lives. But I think this is also true for comedians and CEOs and, and entrepreneurs um, and investors. If you're not living an interesting life, you're not you're not gathering the breadth of experience you need to create the insights you need to then be good at whatever it is that you do. That's great. Yeah, I really love that story. But yeah, we have an international crowd in the audience. So let's yeah. ask them how they perceive success, actually. And, and I have a little poll here. And, sure. uh, meanwhile, there. So how has the definition of success actually changed in your life? How do you perceive it differently now than before? Yeah, I think when I was younger, I thought success was somehow money or influence or, um, uh, you know, these sort of external metrics. I've come to understand success, and I wrote an article about this not long ago, but to me, my definition of success is autonomy. How much control do I have over my life day to day? And, and you look at often very, very successful people, and they're the least free people in the world. And, and I've always been of the, I've, I've come to be of the mind that if you don't have control over your life, over what you do day to day, how can you say that you're successful? Um, you know, if, if you don't control what you wear, if you don't control what you go, where you go, if you don't control your time, you're not successful, you're a slave. And so I, I've, I've tried to set up my life and I try to look at the opportunities that come my way in, in, in their relation to, how much control I have over my life. So today, this is the only this is the only thing in my schedule for the entire day. That doesn't mean I'm not working. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work a full day. I'm just not doing anything for anyone other than this one thing. So even I have a rule with my assistant, like I'm not allowed to schedule more than a, like two or three things in a single day. Because to me, I want that blank space in my calendar. I want the freedom to be able to go where I want to go, to do what I want to do, to follow my interests or my, you know, my, if I get in the zone, to follow that wherever it takes me, as opposed to having a conference call at 2.30 and then a, a you know, a dinner meeting at 5. It seems like we lost the connection to Ryan for a while, but we'll, I'm sure that we'll get him back there. But Sorry, can you see me? 
Yeah, now we can see you here. Oh, sorry, I don't know where I cut off, but but in short, I was probably droning on anyway. In short, for me, the definition of success is autonomy. How much control do I have over my life, over my day, over the decisions I make? And if if something comes my way, it's very lucrative, but it, it deprives me of freedom, then then I then I have a real dilemma there. But but having that clear definition of success is 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 essential or you end up making decisions that can actually make you less successful. That's cool. If we kind of show the poll results here, so people, we didn't give that option exactly, but kind of feeling of having made the right choices was actually by far the, the biggest uh, uh, kind of description for this personal success. Does this surprise you or? No, I think that's right. I think we're saying the same thing. You know, success is, it, here's another thing, and, and the Stoics talk about this. If your success is based on recognition from others, or if your success is, you know, winning this contest or, or you know, uh, uh, earning this amount of money, the problem is that's not fully in your control. So what I think about even with my own books is success is, did I write the best book possible? Success is not where does it debut on the bestseller list. Success can't be, um, you know, what awards does it win? Um, how many nice emails that I get? because I don't control that, it's not up to me. So it would really suck if I spent two years working on a project and then because it was ahead of its time or because something crazy was happening in the world, it didn't get the recognition that it deserved. Now all of a sudden something that that's actually objectively great, I'm now being told was a failure. And so for me, my definition of success on a specific project, it always pertains to whether this part of it was in my control or not. Mm, that's really nice. Yeah. And today, of course, we are going to talk about the ego and, and why is that the enemy? And uh, can you give us some examples that where uh, ego plays a role in our life and how it affects us, actually? Well, let's go back to what we were just talking about with success. If ego, ego needs to be validated by other people. It needs to hear from the outside world that you're good enough that you're important, that you're better than other people. Ego is important in relation to everyone else. Um, I contrast that with confidence. Confidence, when I put out a book, and I'm actually putting out a, a book today, um, I know it's the best thing that I've done. I know I worked really hard. I know that I didn't take any shortcuts. And I know that I'm getting better as a writer. Those, that's part of my sort of success. Now, if it sold a million copies today, or if it sold zero copies, I want to get in a place where that doesn't affect me. That doesn't make me feel better than anyone if it's successful, and it doesn't make me feel worse than anyone if it doesn't do as well as it thought, as I thought. So where, where, where ego is vulnerable is that it's controlled by other people. If, if, if everyone is criticizing you, ego feels bad. If everyone is praising you, ego feels good. You know. Um, as the market goes up and down, you don't want to be riding that. You want to be, as the Stoics say, an even keel along the way. So, you know, if we think about what writing is, what entrepreneurship is, what running a business is, what leadership is, um, it's about your ability to work with other people. And if if you're so obsessed, if everything is about you, which is really what I think ego is, it makes it extraordinarily hard for you to function in that environment. You, what what we need instead is 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 confidence and and so i make a big distinction between those two things mm. that's that is a good point and then if you put self esteem and ambition there in the line so so how would you combine these and and where should the focus actually be then with us well, ourselves you know self esteem is a pretty great phrase right it's esteem from one's self I think the problem is a lot of people hand that self-esteem over to other people and then they wonder why they're not getting what they need. If you can create that within yourself, you come from a position of strength. If you're dependent on outside validation, you're quite vulnerable. Now, I am ambitious. I'm always trying to get better at what I'm doing. But as I said, I control that. Um, Bill Belichick uh, and Nick Saban, two of the greatest American football coaches of all time, talk about the distinction between an inner scorecard and an outer scorecard. You know, the inner scorecard is, are we playing well? Are we executing the way that we, you know, we're trying to execute? Are we fulfilling our potential? The external scorecard is, you know, what's the score of the game? And so you'll look at some of these coaches and you'll see that they're unhappy on the sideline, even though they're winning. And that's because they know they're not playing as well as they could be. 
And then you'll see them winning. And uh, it's, they're not the happiest person in the world because they know maybe they got lucky or they know maybe actually the team wasn't what they could have been. And so I tend to focus on this inner scorecard as far as my ambition goes. Am I growing? Am I getting better? Am I realizing my potential? Rather than focusing on these external metrics, which again are very, uh, make you very vulnerable. Hmm. Yeah, apart from sports, you often also refer to, to the soldiers and generals and others. And, and one thing that I find intriguing is a General Sherman story there yes. where he actually got opportunities to advance in his career, but he didn't take those opportunities. So, so what, why? Why did he choose to do that? And, and what's the learning for us from that? Yeah, there's a famous moment in the American Civil War where Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman are both assigned uh, to, to take this city known as Vicksburg. And what's extraordinary about this moment is that Sherman, who, who technically been in the army longer, outranks Grant. And so potentially there's this, uh, there's this point of conflict. Who's in charge? Um, but, but Grant had been uh, you know, extremely successful lately. Grant was, was technically uh, the, the superior officer. And, and Sherman says, I am at your disposal and sort of answers to him as the boss. And they become this, this incredibly well-functioning team and, and both become two of the greatest American generals in, in history. Um, and, and I think this idea of, of rank, who's in charge, who's better, you know, uh, the, to use the, the, the vulgar expression in business, sometimes we talk about dick measuring contests, right? What, what happens is, is that everyone's so concerned about themselves. Where do I fit? Am I most important? when really we should be focusing on the team, we should be focusing on the objective. And so this ability for Sherman and Grant to function together, to work together is integral to, to the success of, uh, of, of you know, the union cause in, in the American Civil War. There's another moment I talk about in World War II where uh, George Marshall, famous uh, for the Marshall Plan, is offered the command of the invasion at Normandy. And he gives it instead to Eisenhower, his subordinate, because he has so much important stuff to do in Washington. And so the idea of passing up responsibility or passing up being in charge or not needing to get the attention because you care more about the results than you do about getting credit is really important. There's a great expression, you know, play for the name on the front of the jersey and they'll remember the name on the back. And I think that's a great sort of ego antidote to think about. Yeah, actually, question from the audience here, uh, a bit related to that. Are you saying that because ego needs to be validated by others, it's a bad thing? How can I use the e e ego then so it would be a useful for me? Yeah, I'm not sure there is a, a, a successful use of ego. Um, you know, sure, it, it, it is. Does it sometimes propel humanity forward that a really egotistical person is so ambitious and so self-absorbed that, that they manage to accomplish something? Of course. But it also makes these people very, very vulnerable, right? You look at someone like a Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs got fired from Apple the first time because of his ego. It was only lucky that, that he was able to come back the second time. You look at someone like Elon Musk. This is an incredibly successful, incredibly talented person. But his ego seems to get him bogged down in these battles on Twitter, you know, uh, uh, you know co unnecessary controversies. And so what I think about is what was the cost of that? What could that, how could that energy have been spent if it wasn't frivolously wasted on these sort of pointless, uh, you know, on, on these sort of pointless, um, uh, you know, pointless conflicts? You look at someone like Donald Trump. I don't think we need to talk about his policies, but when Donald Trump is elected, he controls not only the presidency, but both houses of Congress in the United States. A pretty unprecedented uh, you know, sort of uh, opportunity to pass all sorts of legislation and accomplish all sorts of things. Why is he unable to do that? He, be, because his ego prevents him from using what's in front of him. And instead, he gets bogged down in all these, uh, you know, uh, other conflicts, all these self-imposed, uh, you know, um, disasters. And so what ego does, there's the, the cost to ego is not that it necessarily makes you unsuccessful, Although there is a, quote, a great quote, ego sucks you down like the law of gravity. What ego does is prevent you from being as successful as you could be if you were more confident as well as more humble and more able to work with other people and focus on what really matters. Hmm. But what would your advice to be for us, uh, the 
founders, entrepreneurs, CEOs. So how do we actually understand that we have an ego that's playing a strong role in our life and how we lead the company? So what would be your advice for us? Well, I have ego as the enemy tattooed on my arm here as a little reminder. Uh, I try to look at it a few times a day and just go like, hey, am I doing this out of ego or not? But like, one of the best exercises for me, and I, I did this before I talked to you guys this morning, is I sit down with a journal and I have a bit of a conversation with myself. I, as a Stokes say, I put myself up for review. And so I take some moments and I just think about what I'm doing, what's going well, what I like about how I've been, where I need to improve. Um, I, I try to look at myself as objectively as possible. And I think that's really what ego is. It's sort of this um, reality distortion field, this thing that's sort of making us see ourselves differently than we actually are. And so taking some time each day to reflect and to review is really important. Um, a couple other things as far as combating ego. You know, ego is really threatened by feedback. So I think one of the ways we keep ourselves humble is we surround ourselves with people who challenge us, people who tell us the truth, people who are also very competent. Um, uh, what you tend to find about very egotistical people is that they're surrounded by yes men and yes women and sycophants. They're surrounded by people who don't challenge them, who feed into their bullshit, um, who lie to them, who, 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 who play into that reality distortion field. So I think surrounding yourself with people who challenge you and giving you the truth is really important. Um, and then I, I, think, I think another thing is, is to continue to challenge yourself. If you're doing the same thing in the same way over and over again, ego creeps in because you think you've mastered it. Um, to continually throw yourself into challenging things, to, to work on projects that, that by, by their very nature, by, by how, very, how hard they are, that also keeps ego in check as well. I like to remain a student of what it is that I do, so I never really feel like I've got it. Um, I'm always pushing myself, and this prevents me from, from getting very conceited. That is interesting, yeah. And um, coming back to the kind of being a student, so so um, mixed martial artist Frank Champion, Frank Shamrock, there you were using in, in the book yep. as an example, who had less, this plus, minus, and equal kind of mm -hmm. like to be a self learner. So, can you elaborate on that? So, how does that work in real life? Yeah, Frank Shamrock was saying that you need to have a mentor who's better than you, like a master you're studying under. You need to have those people who are sort of evenly matched with you. So, when I when I talked about the other competent people around you. And then you also need to be paying this forward in terms of how you're teaching someone else. Uh, Seneca said, we learn as we teach. So how are you sort of getting it from all angles then? That not only keeps the ego in check, but it, but it, uh, but it, but it makes you better as you go. So uh, what, I, what I think about is, is how do I remain a student of what it is that I'm doing? What am, what am I learning? What am I focused on? Where am I, where am I trying to get better? And then how am I very quickly taking what I've just learned and passing it along to, to other people? So, um, you know, I think what you tend to find is that the true masters of martial arts or the guitar or, uh, you know, of writing or of film or of business, these are incredibly humble people because they know how hard it is uh, to do what they're doing. There's a great quote from the physicist John Wheeler. He says, as your island of knowledge grows, so does the shoreline of ignorance. So even as you get better, even as you learn, even as you become more successful, this shouldn't be making you feel more certain, more, um, uh, you know, more egotistically or arrogantly under the impression that you know everything. Um, it should be reminding you and constantly showing you all that there is left for you to learn. So another way to think about this is, if you think you've learned everything there is to know, you're right. And if you feel like you haven't learned everything there is to know, you are also right. And so which one do you want to be? Do you wanna be the person who has more left to learn and is therefore always getting better? Or do you wanna be the person who has cut themselves off prematurely from additional knowledge? That is a really good tip. Glad to be right, even regardless of the answer. Yes. The other thing that I find interesting, a lot of people talk about passion, find your passion and success will follow and you will do. But you are actually saying that there is a trap with passion that it can lead to egoism and, and you kind of focus on the wrong things. And you talk about purpose being the, actually the deciding factor that we should focus on. So passion is about you, 
right? Passion is, I love this. This gets me excited. I can't wait to do this for me. And I contrast that with purpose, which is about someone or something larger than yourself. So, um, you know, for me, what, what, what I get, what gets me excited is the opportunity to bring ancient wisdom into modern life, right? To me, that's my purpose. I've, I discovered this philosophy, Stoicism, and I feel really excited to spread and share it and bring it to other people. That's my purpose. Passion would be, I'm so excited about this new book. This book is going to be my best book yet. This book is going to sell so many copies, right? So to me, I, I, I think you want to have a purpose that's larger than oneself. And this inherently humbles you because there's going to be moments where you have to choose between what's good for you and what's good for the cause. And if you're motivated by sort of ego, you're going to choose uh, what's, what's, what's good for you. And if you're motivated by the, the purpose or the cause, you're going to choose what's good for, for everyone, even if it comes at the expense of you. Um, I, I, I tell the story of John Boyd, who was a, a great fighter pilot and strategist. And he, he, would, he would give every young person that he mentored, he would give them what he called the to be or to do speech. And I think this is a really important distinction that goes to the idea of purpose or passion as well. You know, he says, um, are you in this to do something? Or are you in this to be someone, right? So he's saying, are you in the military because you want to be powerful and important? Or are you in the military because you want to do powerful and important things? And I think if you focus on the doing, if you focus on the, the, the cause, if you focus on, on something larger than oneself, rather than the trappings or the appearance of success, or rather than yourself, um, it's just a much better way to go through life. Hmm. That is very true. I, I like that. Um, many times also when we kind of look outside, so of course for companies, we talk about that we start with the purpose and, and that. And, and often when we hear stories about successful companies, we think that when they have this aha moment, that just that one single moment, and that's why they became successful when they just continued with the path that was set right. for them, like Jeff that's Bezos right. with Amazon and everything. So, so what's your take on that? Well, so to go back to this idea of purpose and passion, I know you guys have had Simon Sinek uh, before, but the idea of your why, I think, is really what we're talking about. What's your why? But it's not as simple as that, of course. Just because you have your why doesn't magically make you successful. There's often so much luck and so much experimentation and so many years of hard work. So one of the things that we do, and I think this is particularly dangerous in our sort of social media culture, is we look at successful people and we go, oh, this person is successful for this reason. So I just need to do that thing. I just need to, to sort of pretend to be like that thing. So Steve Jobs is a great example of this where, you know, people saw him as this kind of arrogant, you know, brilliant genius uh, who was just, you know, somewhat of a tyrant, you know. And so you see a lot of CEOs, especially young CEOs and entrepreneurs, kind of pretending to be like that almost aping how, how Steve Jobs was. But was that why Steve Jobs was successful or was Steve Jobs successful because he had this deep intuitive sense of what his customers wanted? Was Steve Jobs successful because he was a brilliant designer, right? Was Steve Jobs successful because he was surrounded by brilliant designers, right? Um, and so, so it's really important that we don't tell ourselves a simple story about success. In fact, uh, the more you look at someone's success, uh, the more complicated it becomes. The more the more uh, you look at your own success, the more complicated it becomes. This my my book here, uh, the obstacle is the way. Um, that that book is now sold over a million copies in thirty languages. So on the one hand, that that makes me look very good. But when I look at the trajectory of that book, first off, that book took um, five years to hit the bestseller list for the first time. So it wasn't at in any way a sure thing. Um, it wasn't in any way obvious that it was going to be successful. In fact, my publisher didn't think it was going to be successful at first. But also, what was its big lucky break? It was that Amazon discounted the book for the first 11 months that it came out. It was, for some reason, it was $3.99 as an ebook, which led to a whole bunch of discoveries. So I got this lucky break that really had nothing to do with me. And so when I look at my success, when I look at when I look at how my other books have sold. I don't compare them so I don't compare them to this book that got this lucky break. I go, hey, that's what happened. That's how this went. Now I want to continue to put myself in a position where I can get lucky. 
but I'm not going to take for granted that that that's sort of mine by right. Or and and I'm also not going to going to conveniently forget that lucky break and give myself more credit than I'm actually due as well. Well, any tips for us on kind of how to prepare ourselves for the hard road ahead, the obstacles that we have, even the failures sometimes. So so what's the mindset that we should have? Well, that's really where ego is so dangerous. Like, look, does ego, if you're successful, does ego make you insufferable? Does it make you complacent? Yes. And is that bad? Absolutely. But the reality is we're going to be unsuccessful in our lives too. We're going to fail. I'm going to put out a book that doesn't sell. Um, your The deal uh, that you've been working on for two years is going to fall through. Um, your company is going to run smack into a pandemic and need to do layoffs, right? We're, we're, we're all going to experience difficult moments. And this is where ego is so dangerous because ego was in our ear the whole time on the way up, whispering about how amazing we are and look at how great we are and look at how everyone loves us. Well, what happens when now we're being criticized? What happens when now um, we're a little embarrassed? What happens when we're humiliated? What happens if we don't have that external validation? Now ego is, is uh, not just not your friend, it's your absolute worst enemy. And it's whispering in your ear, these people are right. You do suck. You are worthless. You are not as good as everyone else. And that's not true either. Just as, as the puffing up was not true, the dragging down is also not true. And so it's really important, again, that we focus on this internal scorecard that allows us to ride out the highs and the lows because both are inevitable. And that's, that's what allows us to, to rebuild after a failure. That's what allows us to get back up after a public embarrassment. That's what allows us to learn from our mistakes. This is another place where ego is so dangerous. If, if you mess up, if you fail, um, if you have humility, you're going to say, well, why did that happen? What, what did I do wrong? What can I do better? How can I prevent this from happening in the future? How can I be improved for this unpleasant experience? But ego does the exact opposite, right? Ego says, this isn't my fault. This is somebody else's fault. I've been screwed over. Um, I'm humiliated. I'm worthless. Again, uh, let's pull up Donald Trump. Donald Trump loses an election. And instead of losing an election and saying, okay, how did I lose? How can I come back in four years and win again? He, he, I mean, he does the unthinkable. He denies that it even happened, right? First off, he creates that reality distortion field we were talking about. And then he sets in motion a chain, a, a chain of events that gets him impeached for, for the second time and, and almost certainly ruins any future prospects as a, as a politician. And so what ego does is it takes bad problems and it makes them much, much, much worse. Really interesting discussions. And now I'm happy to see what the audience wants to ask from you. Actually, the first question is, is about that, that. How do successful people get over laziness and push through? Yeah, I mean, uh, Stephen Pressfield talks about the idea of resistance. We all have resistance. So I prefer not to think about it as laziness. And I just think about um, what is what is getting in the way of what uh, I'm trying to do and, and why am I doing that? And usually the root of laziness or resistance is fear. We're, we're, we're afraid of either success or failure. We're afraid of taking a risk. We're afraid of being embarrassed. And and so I try to I try to get down to the to the core of why I'm feeling that feeling. So that's one thing I think about. And then I think day to day, it's it's about habits and routine. I, I talk about my book, Stillness is the Key. I talk about just the power of routine. Um, so by having a routine, having a set of things that I do every day, no matter what, it, it allows me to sort of push through that fear. Because even if I'm being afraid, even if I'm a little worried, even if I'm feeling a little lazy, it doesn't matter. Here's what I do at 9 a.m. Here's what I do at 10 a.m. Here's what I do at 11 a.m. And, 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 and I think that routine is really important. And yeah, just to elaborate on that, you actually also talk about kind of that when you are in a leadership position, the routines are actually, and that's kind of management task or others, they are super important for success. Would you elaborate on that as well? Why? Yeah, a, a leader has to be disciplined and organized in what they do. Otherwise, their ego can take them down a, a million rabbit holes. Micromanagement to me is a form of ego needing to be involved in every little thing that happens. It feels good to be wrapped up in drama, to be always needed. But in fact, the, the leader has to have discipline and systems and a routine 
So they're focused on the things that only they can do as the leader. Um, so, you know, when you look at, at egotistical leaders, they tend to be very undisciplined, have very bad routines, tend to fu function in a lot of chaos. And when you look at confident, self-disciplined leaders, they tend to be very organized, very routine-based, and, and very sort of limited in their scope. They're focused only on the thing in front of them and only the things that they need to be focused on. Hmm. Very, very smart answer there. Thanks for that. Chris is asking, um, how can you deal with an egotistical leader? Yeah, well, so first off, if we're talking about, you know, what's in our control, what's not in our control, I, I tend to focus on, on my ego first. Where is ego holding me back rather than trying to cure or solve someone else's ego? But I usually look at ego as a sign of, of uh, as a warning sign. It's someone or something that I want to not be exposed to or not be involved with uh, because it, I know where it's going, right? As I said, ego sucks us down like the law of gravity. I don't want to be anywhere near an egotistical leader because I know where that's going to end. I would flip this though, again, what do we control? I would say for the people that you're in charge of, for your department, for your company, for your life, you should have a no ego rule. And, and your primary objective as a leader is to not just model egolessness, but to, to keep ego out of your team, out of your organization, um, because it spreads like a cancer and it's very infectious. Hmm. That is true. The next question is a bit also personal on your situation. So how do you maximize your productivity when I've been a dad for young kids? And uh, what are the, some of the strategies you have used? Well, to, to go back to this idea of routine, I, I think it's all about routine. Now, before I had kids, I had one routine. I, this is what I did every day. I now think about it in terms of routines, plural, right? Because you're always being thrown a curveball. Your kid didn't sleep last night or your kid wakes up sick or your kid has to go to, to soccer practice or something. You, you have to be much more flexible. So I think about it also in terms of practices. What are the core things that I do every day, no matter what? Am I okay shuffling the order? Yes, uh, but but uh, but these are the things that I do every day. Um, a, a couple rules I have that that have made me not just more productive and 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 a, uh, but but also a better parent, more connected with my kids. So I wake up early. Uh, I go to bed early. I wake up early. Uh, I journal in the morning. I don't use my phone for the first one hour that I'm awake. I think too many people wake up and immediately get sucked into email immediately get sucked into social media. And instead, they should be spending that time uh, doing a little thinking, being present, planning the day. Uh, and so uh, on days where it's not four degrees outside, uh, the first thing I do with my kids is, is we go for a long walk. We go for about a three mile walk together as a family. We're outside, we spend time together. So, so not only does that put me in a place of peace and contentment and happiness um, that I carry with me throughout the day, um, and it's it's great physical exercise. But the other part of it is is now, let's say I do have to stay late at the office. Let's say I am distracted all day. I know that at the very minimum, I spent one hour of great family time with my kids at the start of the day, and they know how I feel about them, and they know that they're a priority for me. And, and so now I can focus on my work without feeling guilt about sort of neglecting them or putting them off. Um, so I have, a, I have a bunch of thoughts on this. I, I know not everyone's a parent, so I won't belabor it. But I do send out an email every day that's totally free uh, at dailydad.com. That It's for all parents. I'm just a dad. That's why it's called Daily Dad. But if you go to dailydad.com, you get this parenting email that I send out every day that people might like. That was a good tip for me, at least. And I <laughs> felt it in my heart that that's how I should start the day. I will change that for sure. The next question comes from Simon, that why is ambition and success important to you if external validation of ego is not? How do, how do you reconcile the two? And, and don't we all want external validation in the end? Sure, look, at, at a certain level, we all need external success in the, in the sense of if you're, if you're, uh, if you're a, 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 you know, an athlete and you're not winning, you're not gonna be on the team very long, right? If, you, if you're an author uh, and your books don't sell, um, you, you can't, you can't pay your rent. You can't survive. Right. So, so of course, uh, you know, if, if your company is not objectively successful to some degree, you're not going to be a company very long. So th there, it, there is some external validation or external metrics that we have to measure ourselves by. Um, if you're a, if you're a runner 
and uh, you know you're you're racing in the hundred yard dash, and uh, uh, you go, oh, I felt like I had a great race, but you had the worst time. You know that's that's not a great position to be in. So there there is some external metric, but I do generally, and this is what I was talking about, try to focus on what I control, what's up to me. Um, I, I try, I, I'm ambitious in the sense that I always want to maximize my potential. I want to become as good as I am capable of, of being. Um, and, 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 and as opposed to, I want to be the, the, uh, the richest author in the world. I want to be the most popular speaker in the world. I want to have the most YouTube views in the world. So my metric is, am I doing great work that I'm proud of, that I know that only I can do, that's getting me closer to who I want to be as a person? That's my ambition. And to go back to that last question, I sort of have three goals in life. And, and this, will, this, this will maybe help clarify that. My three goals are to be a great writer, a great husband, and a great father. So great is in, in, in those things, great, what does that mean? That's a thing that I decide, right? This isn't uh, an award that I win. This isn't, you know, a certain number of copies or, or whatever. This is, you know, this is a, an internal scorecard that I have. Am I, am I living up to my own standards? And those three goals are also in relation to each other. So if, if being more successful as an author comes at the expense of being a great father, well, then, then that's a problem, and I've got to even those two things out. So uh, I, I hope that answers your question. I think so. And if you have time for one last question, sure. it's not an easy one, though. But what, what question, if appreciated properly, would, would most improve our understanding of ourselves? Hmm. That, that, is, that, is, uh, that is the core of philosophy, I guess. Um, how do we improve improve our understanding of ourselves? Um, man, that is a tough question. I do not have a good I do not have a good answer. Um, I, I think it's a lot of questions. I try to ask myself, you know, what what's motivating me here? Um, Tim Ferriss has a great question. What would this look like if it were easy? Um, I try to ask myself you know, to be or to do, as we were talking about earlier. I try to ask myself, um, you know, uh, am, am, you know, is, am I, am I doing this uh, for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? I, I try to, I have a lot of questions that I go through and I think my, my journaling, uh, my, my, my morning journaling is an ongoing discussion with myself on these questions. So I wish there was a magical question that, that, that automatically unlocked, uh, unlocked our uh, our understanding of ourselves but i think it's much more of a, of a lifetime of questions um and 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 realizing that you know when you ask yourself this question last year versus 10 years from the future you know you're going to have a different reaction to it and it's going to pose different different uh different answers and questions as well so i i guess i would think about it more as an ongoing process as opposed to a a thing you do one time well that is a solid answer and yeah Thank you so much, Ryan Holiday, for joining us. A lot of important key takeaways here to, for all of us.